Hi everyone, konnichiwa minasan. Presentation ni kitte kurete arigatou gozaimasu. Etto ne, kyo wa open source program office ni tsuite hanasimashou. Okay, I'm just gonna switch into English. I I think it was a good idea to start this in uh, presentation in Japanese since, well, we are in Open Source Summit Japan, even though we cannot be in Japan right now. But, uh, well, thanks again for having me today. And thank you a lot, all the attendees, before moving to the topic of today that is going to be about OSPO archetypes and open source program offices. I would like to give you a short introduction of the different topics we will go through this present during this presentation. So during the first minutes, I will share with you some of the motivations uh, of why doing this talk. And also I will share some of the resources that you might find useful uh, when, um, when presenting this talk. Also, I would like to give you some context of why open source is a critical asset for innovation, why digital transformation is forcing organizations to have a more sophisticated relationship with the open source ecosystem and not just realizing that your organization is using open source, but how to evolve that and start contributing and even building leadership around open source projects and open source communities. And also how OSPOs or open source program offices can be a competitive advantage to accelerate this process. Uh, then we will move to some of the ideas I have had in mind based on some testimonials from OSPO professionals and some previous discussions. Again, this will be uh, some personal opinion um, that has been reinforced with previous surveys and also testimonials, as I said, but still a personal opinion that that's why I would love to bring the discussion and, and have more feedback from other professionals uh, in, in this uh, space today. And this is, will be related with uh, how to structure OSPOs across different stages and also bring the discussion of the OSPO archetypes and the different types we can find. And finally, if I have time, I will briefly introduce the OSPO accelerators and how to collaborate across communities such as OpenChain, LF Energy, or Finance. So saying this, um, I hope you enjoy this presentation and I will go ahead and try to share my slides for today's topic. Thank you so much. Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen and we can we can start most of the content you will find during this presentation comes from a wide range of open source professionals that has been contributing to to do resources helping all the OSPOs to start and also to advance okay so now um let's explain first why bringing this topic at open source summit japan today so the first motivator is to put together insights from previous OSPO survey results and provide context for these results so through some of the existing OSPO public testimonials from different organizations. And the second one is bringing a discussion on ways to come up with common OSPO terminology across sectors and align with the diverse open source community that helps the OSPO movement or has influence in the creation of OSPOs. So also please remember that the topics are based on public resources available in external blogs from organizations that has an OSPO and or are using um, to do 
resources. Uh, so I'm gonna add them here in case you would like to take a look at them while attending to this presentation. Okay, so let's move now to uh, the topic of today. And first let's begin by giving some context. Okay, so I'd like to start with this sentence, the innovation race, right? So software is the ultimate source of innovation of companies. And nowadays, um, as many of you know, more than 80% of modern application has open source components. So what it means is that um, digital transformation is forcing every single organization to be open source forward. And now realizing that your company is an open source consuming consumer is, is not enough. So you need to take actions. And this is when we think about velocity as, as an important topic to take in mind. Because um, in open source, um, it doesn't matter to be a leading a leading technology or a leading brand. So if you are in a leading positions, but your rivals are faster than you, they will cut up. And if you fall behind, but you are moving fast, you will cut up. So again, this is an innovation race and open source is everywhere. So we understand that um, the innovation race is now the open source race, but open source is a community of communities. And that brings a completely new way of doing things for many companies in terms of security, leadership, infrastructure, policies, and more. So that's why it is important that all people within a company have clear goals and follow a direction or mission um, within the organization. So in this scenario, a strategy can provide this vision and prevent individuals from losing sight of their company aims. Um, and it is here where OSPO can serve as the company open source strategy. But what is exactly an OSPO? Open source program offices has been proved by multiple organizations to be the designed uh, center of competency for our organization's open source operation and structure. And this can include setting code use, distribution, selection, auditing, and other policies, as well as training developers ensuring legal compliance and promoting and building community engagement um, that benefits the organization in a strategic way. So we can also define it as the linchpin between the open source ecosystem and the organization. But the question that we are having right now from, from several uh, people is uh, how critical are getting OSPOS. Um, it's a well-known term already implemented by organizations. Are organizations finding value in building a strategy about around open source? So um, let's take a deeper look at some of the insights from the last OSPOS survey conducted by the Twitter group in collaboration with the LF research to, um, to explain this a bit. Um, Small comment here for those who doesn't know, the Twitter group is a project under the Linux Foundation umbrella formed by a network of OSPO professionals from different organizations and industry who want to collaborate on practices and um, uh, tools and other ways to run successful and effective open source projects and programs. And these this surveys are some of the initiatives we are currently running. Okay, so coming back to, to the survey, um, I would like to highlight three main points. So the first one is that, as you consider, 
Uh, you, you have the full survey in the link, by the way. So the first point is that respondents were twice as likely as last year to believe that funding for the company's open source initiatives will increase this fiscal year because of macroeconomic conditions. The second topic here important is that um, around 63% of organizations that have open source program offices said that those programs are very or extremely business critical. So uh, also this survey data saw that an increase of from 54% to 63% in respondents saying the OSPO is very or extremely critical to the success of their engineering or product teams. And the third topic is that OSPOs are also growing more professional through formal structure. Um, and this is because we found that 58% of OSPOs are formally structured up from 54% in 2020. So overall, um, I would really recommend to take a deeper look to this service because um, I don't, I can get, cannot get into detail here, but I think it's important. And you will see that overall, um, we are facing a new OSPO era with emerging OSPOs everywhere, uh, which demands more detailed education and guidance about how to set up OSPOs across different industries. Uh, so in order to explain this more a bit, let's see some of the diversity that is hitting the OSPO community nowadays, okay? So we are seeing this diversity um, across industry. So OSPO's um, initially was more based in tech. But now we are seeing OSPOs in automotive, in banking, in education, governments, retail. And that means different ways of, of setting up OSPOs. Like, for instance, it's not the same the way a company in the financial sector um, that will implement open source and start an OSPO in a different way than a traditional tech company that has been using and contributing to open source over the last decade. And you can see here um, some of the examples of, of this uh, diversity and, and where OSPOs are uh, starting to grow. So we saw, for instance, ports uh, in the last months uh, launched um, their open source initiative in the automotive sector. We are seeing um, OSPOs in governments. Um, the European Commission is, uh, has an OSPO. Um, recently, in, from, in the, coming from the financial se sector, Goldman Sachs also um, created an open source program office. And there are more news here about organizations also not only in the private sector, but in the public sector, universities and other public institutions willing to or already having an OSPO. And also another, another uh, differentiation we can find is the structure. Because when you ask people uh, how do you manage your their OSPO? It's completely different depending on uh, the industry type, depending on the when when was the OSPO created, depending on the size of the company, and so on. So um, we can find OSPOs within the Research and Development Center. We can even find virtual OSPOs. So we don't have an OSPO, but part of um, the engineering team, for instance, part of their time are expended in um, creating an open source strategy. So that can be, for instance, one example of virtual OSPO or no official OSPOs. It can also be 
place it in a corporate level. So corporate level OSPO, which supports in division level OSPOs. And this is the, more, the most common one, OSPOs as part of the CDO office or engineering. So one of the many topics within the OSPOverse is how to face this OSPO wave that brings different needs and requirements. So in other words, how to bring order to something where there is no template to do things. So from this point until the end of this presentation, I would like to share with you some of the ideas gathered over the last months based on the work done with the two initiatives and previous discussions with other OSPO professionals. So I would like to, I would love to hear your feedback and um, maybe later we can keep this discussion in the OSPO forum and define some action items if you're interested. In my honest opinion, there are two premises that we could meet. The first one is learning from others. Um, and that's why having communities and initiatives that promotes and evangelize OSPO's activities around the world is so important because there is no pro template of, for building an open source program that applies across all industries. And that can be its creation a challenge, but um, you can learn lessons from other organizations that were there before you and bring them together to fit your own organization's requirements. And then the second one is to build standards. And I know sometimes uh, it's difficult to say this, but we need constraints to explain the real world. And this is exactly what it is. Um, However, standards still come from a transparent, collaborative, and neutral source, in my honest opinion, and not from a single company. Um, that's why the role that foundations play here is, can be so important, because they can act as the neutral players to bring those standards proposed from a wider community of experts and organizations from different points of view and ideas. Having said that, I would like to come up with the different OSPO stages any organization usually faces. And again, the importance and time taken on each stake stage might depend on the industry type, open source culture, science, size, and, and more. So let's briefly introduce each of them. So at the very beginning, I added the pre-OSPO and it's more focused on awareness. I think this is an important section to mention, even though sometimes there is no even OSPO form there. Um, and it is usually the state of trying to convince the C-level and senior managers to have a centralized and strategic place for the organization's open source software operations. And this usually requires the documentation, use cases, testimonials, and, and ongoing education. And then uh, we can move to the initial states. That is when the organization may focus more on the internal procurement, training, and documentation before actually start interacting with other open source projects. So this is not just using them, but contributing to them or releasing their um, own open source projects. And here the legal and developer education are the uh, predominant topics. So once legal requirements regarding open source consumption are in place, uh, this needs to be transferred to developers. So how to use open source, contribute to upstream project, which projects they can contribute to. Uh, so that means shifting to a more educational state, I will say, uh, through developer education, senior management, and only when we have a safe and supportive environment, we might drive more attention to 
track engagement and find ways to host open source projects. And finally, in the last stage or layer, you can call it, OSPO can become a strategic partner for technology decisions, helping to guide choices and save long-term commitments to projects. If we map these milestones with two variables, so one referring to the OSPO level and the other referring to the execute open source operations within an organization, we can visualize better these milestones. Um, so as you can see, safety remains across the different OSPO age, but the goals will be different when the organization does not have an OSPO and it's just an open source software consumer than when it's actively contributing upstream and has a community around. Okay, so let's say that if the organization has already a supportive internal community of developers that knows how to contribute to open source projects, um, they might want to know to pay attention to how to increase the engagement of their contribution to those open source projects or how to improve the quality of those contributions. And of course, in all these OSPO archetypes, there are influence from the size of the organization and the team, the industry and the cultural gap and the framework. So legal barriers that maybe uh, because you are in a certain area or country, it's different from uh, what happens if you were in another different place. So what we have seen so far is uh, one of the many ideas uh, where we can define OSPO archetypes and try to bring a standard way to formalize OSPOs and try to bring some order into this chaotic world we are living in right now. Um, next topic, uh, really quick, that I would like also to bring the same way open source um, OSPOs are open source accelerators. Um, we can also find OSPO accelerators. So I'm talking about these initiatives or communities that help your organization to accelerate your open source initiatives or OSPO in different ways. Um, and this doesn't imply to have external communities only. We can also take advantage of in-house initiatives. So for instance, um, I'm pretty sure uh, if all the attendants here that has an OSPO or maybe they are planning to have one may have been also thinking about uh, establishing an inner source initiatives or they are already working in an inner source initiatives. So inner source has a lot of common things that can uh, use later when creating an OSPO. Um, on the on the other hand, we can also find external initiatives that might help. So we can find these in external initiatives through neutral players. So those are foundations and projects within foundations that can help. So maybe we can find open chains, for instance, that is more focused on open source legal compliance and, and uh, ISO standards. Um, really helpful in uh, this legal part of the OSPO, for instance. Um, and we also have private organizations, uh, consultants in firms uh, also that are offering OSPO service that are, of course, very important as well. But let's take a deeper look to this um, foundation and neutral players. Because uh, I want to, to bring attention here because there, is, there are so many different um, organizations and projects, uh, even within the Linux Foundation, uh, that has something to share for the OSPO ecosystems. Um, 
And every, all these different initiatives um, has different ways of, of adding value to OSPOS. So maybe uh, we find, for instance, the tutor group is more like a, a guide or, uh, initiative. So it's more like in the strategic part, but there are also enablers. So what, what do I, what, what I uh, mean by enables is like um, organizations that are, uh, has expertise on a specific industry. Uh, so for instance, Finos for the financial sector or LF Energy for the energy sector uh, that can help to overcome these uh, industry specific barriers when starting the open source journey and also accelerated the OSPO adoption. And also we have facilitators. So may, as, as I uh, previously explained, uh, there are different OSPO stages. Some of them are more community focused and others are more um, legal and risk assessment focused. And in the LF, um, in LF we have a lot of different communities um, also for this, for specific topics that covers the specific topics and that of course can help the OSPO community. So um, at Tutor Group, we are trying to build the most comprehensive OSPO infrastructure and network, trying to collaborate with these communities that are helping OSPO's movement to build um, this OSPO solution infrastructure, and we have called it the OSPO Associates. So this is just really quick. If you would like to learn more and how to and find ways to, to collaborate across communities, you can go to the information in this empty file and, and check more about this initiative. And last but not least, this is a short story about Tudor Group and what we do. So as I said, we are a group of organizations uh, that tries to define uh, practices and wants to collaborate on tools and otherwise to run successful and effective open source projects and programs worldwide. And I didn't say anything a little, uh, about myself because I wanted to uh, to finish this um, this presentation first. Um, this is this is me. Uh, previously, I work at Peteria, so I spent there more than three years helping organizations in their inner source and open source metrics journey. I'm currently the OSPO program manager at Tudor Group that is a group of organization advocating for OSPO education. I recently finished my master's degree in data science. And I'm also involved in several communities such as Chaos Project, Tutor Group, Inner Source Commons, Devrel Collective and Devrel Spain. Um, there is my Twitter. If you want to uh, look for me on LinkedIn is the same name I added there, Ana Jimenez Santa Maria. And I really hope you enjoy today's presentations. Uh, there are some of the tutor resources. If you would like to join the community, just go to the Slack channel, join and say hi. Thank you so much. I'll be, I'll be here for you to answer any questions you have. See you soon and bye-bye.